Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Outer Rim Cantina. My name is Alan and today I'm here to do a little bit of a different video. I don't have a script for this one. Uh, I just wanted to uh, get up here and talk about my uh, recent trip to Galaxy's Edge. So I got to go to Disney World for a couple of days uh, last week, right before The Rise of Skywalker premiered, and I uh, hit up Epcot and Hollywood Studios with, of course, my main reason for going being to go to Galaxy's Edge. So I just kind of wanted to talk about my experience and what I thought of the whole thing and whether or not it's actually worth it to make a trip to Disney to actually go and see it. So, uh, first of all, I just want to say that it was completely packed the day I went. I went, uh, last Monday. Yeah, last Monday by the time this video goes up. Um, not this previous Monday, Monday before that. The, mon the last Monday before The Rise of Skywalker came out is when I went. And it was completely packed. Uh, back in Galaxy's Edge, it was, like, wall-to-wall -wall crowded, and it was even worse in the Toy Story Land, but I didn't spend much time there, obviously, uh, but I spent most of my time in Batu. Uh, but I can say that the overall, like, immersion and kind of experience of being inside or being on a Star Wars planet was definitely there. Like, when you walk into Galaxy's Edge, you, they did a very good job of making it feel really separate from the rest of the park. So as soon as you pass through the entrance into Galaxy's Edge, you don't hear any other sounds from the rest of the park. You hear some ambient noises, I'm pretty sure, of like, you know, s space bugs and stuff like that. But like once you're inside Galaxy's Edge, you are there on Batu, and there is very little aside from, I mean, the basic theme park stuff to break your immersion. And because it's a theme park, you of course have to have a little suspension of disbelief to actually have a good time. But uh, overall, I did. I enjoyed the immersion. I think it could have been a little better uh, if I went at a time when it was less crowded, but I still didn't have a horrible experience despite there being people everywhere. And one of the first things that I did when I got there was go to Savi's workshop and build my own lightsaber. Now, I almost didn't get to do that because I didn't find out until the uh, day before I was going to Hollywood Studios that I went to uh, Disney in Orlando. Uh, I didn't find out till the day before that I actually needed a reservation for Savi's workshop to actually go and do the whole lightsaber thing. And when I went and checked, all of the reservations for the Sunday and Monday that I was there were going to be full, and of course the Tuesday, the day I was leaving, was open, and the rest of last week leading up to the Rise of Skywalker premiere was empty, but then uh, this week and next week and pretty much the whole rest of the month uh, was full again. So, as I went to Epcot on Sunday, I was trying to come up with a whole plan in my head. I was going to say, okay, we're going to leave really, really early from the hotel, get to Hollywood Studios, and stand in line to make sure we're in line before the park's open make sure we're in line before the park opens at 7. So we got we got to Hollywood Studios at 6.50, which was a bit later than I wanted, but it was still really early for us, and there were obviously still a whole bunch of people that were already in line before us, but we were standing in line, 7 o'clock rolled around, everybody started pouring in, and there were so many people in front of us that it took uh, 20 minutes, yeah, it took us 20 minutes to actually get into the park. That was my original plan that I was going to do. Get there early, run back to Galaxy's Edge, and see if I could do a walk-up for the lightsaber thing. Um, but the Sunday night, the, the night before that I was going to go, I decided just to check the reservation thing again, and there were some cancellations, or they made some more time slots or something, because there, there were a few slots for Tuesday available, so because I had basically already decided to get to the park, at 7, I went ahead and made the reservation for 7.25, and as soon as I was finished filling out all the information, making the reservation, I went back to the uh, reservation page and checked, and as soon as I made mine, Tuesday was full again, so I just barely managed to get in a reservation to actually be able to do the lightsaber thing. So we got there, I was able to do the lightsaber thing, and actually you can see it right, right there uh, on my wall with um, 
a little little stand that uh, I got with it. So yes, the lightsabers are $200, and I paid a bit more for mine because I wanted the stand so I could add it as a beautiful display piece uh, to my Star Wars wall there. But I would say that uh, it is actually well worth the $200, and uh, the way I look at it is that this lightsaber is about the quality of like a $150 roughly saber that you could uh, order online from any of the, you know, custom uh, saber manufacturers out there. Um, and you're paying the other $50 for the whole experience and show of getting to put together your very own lightsaber, which all in all, uh, it took about 15 or 20 minutes um, to actually, you know, go through the whole sequence and everything. But here it it is in all of its glory, and it turned out really well. I'm very proud of it, and I knew that these things were supposed to be heavy, but like, this thing actually does have a lot of heft to it, because all the pieces are metal, so it is incredibly sturdy, and it's just overall, I think it is very good for the price. If you're, I've never really been interested in uh, custom lightsabers, or just like ordering a custom saber uh, from the internet, but when I found out that you could actually build one through this whole show experience thing at Galaxy's Edge, I really wanted to do it, so here is mine. I picked the uh, Peace and Justice um, category out of the four. They had Peace and Justice, Power and Control, um, and something with Serenity, and then something with Wisdom, I think. I can't remember the other two right off the top of my head, but I picked the you know, basic... Uh, like Clone Wars or Republic era Peace and Justice, and I am I'm really happy with how it turned out, and I and wow voice crack, <laughs> I'm really happy with how it turned out, uh, and I did get mine in purple because purple is the best color, and also every single lightsaber color test I've ever taken throughout my entire life, I have always ended up with a purple lightsaber, so purple is just my color, but I did go ahead and buy. A uh, yellow kyber crystal so uh, actually let me see if I can get the camera to focus on it nope that doesn't work wait wait there we go yeah so I bought a another uh, yellow kyber crystal and it's basically just a well drop the cap but it's basically just a, uh, a plastic rock right here that I can switch out with the purple crystal in uh, my lightsaber and be able to change the color and in addition to that uh, it also comes with this uh, sheath or carrying case with the whole Jedi design thing on it and it's a very long case uh, with a strap so you can carry it on your back I actually still have the tags on mine uh, but you also get a 30 inch uh, combat ready lightsaber blade with it so if you can just get it out of this thing there we go so here is the the blade that it comes with I'll pick that up later uh, here's the blade that it comes with it's just a white blade and you put it into the lightsaber like so and then it makes a bit of a noise and it's locked in like that and then you turn it on and boom it does that and it looks kind of pink uh, with the light on but let me turn the light off there we go <laughs> this looks better for a lightsaber so it makes you know, all the noises and stuff and when you hit it it let me see if I can get it on camera I don't think it shows up on camera but it flashes green like the lightsabers in the original trilogy do so that's a little neat feature and um, when you change the color of the blade, uh, it also makes like a different ignition sound and also has uh, different humming sound effects. So I did notice that the that the yellow crystal actually in the lightsaber um, makes it look kind of like a yellow greenish. And I was watching some videos on yellow lightsabers earlier today, and I don't know if they did that on purpose because you can't Jedi can't really you know, have yellow crystals, there's a whole special reason for that uh, that George Lucas came up with but never fully explained. 
Uh, so I think that's why it looks kind of yellow-greenish and more like Ahsoka Tano's uh, second lightsaber from the Clone Wars than an actual yellow lightsaber that, like, the Temple Guards might have or something. It's just a little inter an interesting little lore thing I thought they included. Or it could just be because the color of the, the LEDs in this blade make it look weird or something. But that is the uh, Galaxy's Edge lightsaber, and like I said, uh, it is, in my opinion, well worth the $200 if you want to build your very own custom lightsaber, and of course get the whole experience and show that goes along with it in Galaxy's Edge, and this and the extra crystal were the only two souvenirs that I bought, <laughs> because this pretty much wiped out my bank account. So that was the first thing I did, and actually, uh, so... I didn't know this until I actually got there, but um, if you don't want to carry around your lightsaber uh, all day while you're in the park, which they're pretty heavy and also kind of cumbersome when you're carrying around this whole big, you know, over 30 inch rod on your back, uh, it can get a little bit tedious. Uh, they actually will, um, if you go into the droid depot uh, in Batu, you know, you'll, you'll uh, write your name down on the special, like, ticket thing, and they will send it to the front of the park to a little building right by uh, the entrance and exit, and you can pick it up there whenever you leave. So that's what I decided to do, because I did not want to be stuck carrying around that big, huge thing for the, what was it, 14 hours that I was actually there in uh, Hollywood Studios. But aside from all of the ambiance and just walking around, and uh, getting to experience everything. The second thing that I did was go to, uh, or stand in line for Smuggler's Run and get to uh, fly, or more accurately, ride in the Millennium Falcon. The line was never under an hour for that. I think I ended up standing in line 80 or 70 or 80 minutes um, the first time that I rode it. Uh, and so, you know, you stand in line, you go through uh, Hondo's a uh, little spaceport area, and of course you get to see the big Millennium Falcon mock-up and everything, and then you get your whole mission from the animatronic Hondo, which, honestly, seeing it in person, like, I knew it was supposed to be, like, the most advanced animatronic ever, uh, or what, however they were putting it, um, but seeing it in person is really something special, because, honestly, that could fool a kid. Like, like it, it really could. It was that lifelike. And even my dad pointed out that, like, if I didn't tell him that was a, that was an animatronic ahead of time, you, he could have probably been convinced that that was, might have been a person. So that was really cool seeing the animatronic, and it was also really cool getting to hear the actual voice of Hondo Onaka from the Clone Wars and Rebels, I guess. Um, I can't remember his name, the voice actor's name right now, but it was really cool that they got him back to do the voice, um, and it was also really cool getting to actually go inside the Millennium Falcon, or at least part of it, uh, the part where the hollow table is, so, uh, they, after they split you up into, uh, smaller groups of six, uh, you get to go into the waiting area that is actually inside the Millennium Falcon, and look around for a little bit until they call your color group, and, of course, they randomly assign you what role you're going to get, whether that be pilot, gunner, or engineer. And so once they call you, they line you up like you're supposed to. You go into the cockpit, you take your seat, and then you go through the whole sequence. And uh, I think the ride is about five minutes long. Uh, the first time that we went, my dad and I both got uh, engineer which, I gotta say, is probably the lamest one, because you're, A, you're sitting in the back of the cockpit, and B, your job is to press buttons on a side panel, and it's honestly kind of distracting sometimes, because, like, you're trying to pay attention to what's happening on screen in front of you, but you also have to keep, you know, looking over to the side to make sure nothing's, you know, like, blowing up or whatever, and looking for those buttons to push. Uh, so, I definitely... The ride was definitely fun the first time I went through the whole sequence and flying the Millennium Falcon and everything. That, that was, it was a really great ride, but I just don't particularly enjoy doing the whole engineer thing. And I feel like they probably could have left that out and nobody would have complained. But I think they wanted to pack as many people as they could into one ride set at a time to, you know, keep everything flowing better and at least attempt to keep the lines down a little bit. So... 
I can kind of see why they did it, but they honestly don't really need the whole engineer thing. It, it doesn't really work. Uh, I did go back later in the day when the line was a bit shorter, I think about 70 minutes, uh, and that time my dad and I got pilots, and that was fun, but also very, very stressful because the, uh, I'd, so I did the right and left stick and my dad did the up and down, but like those sticks, they are so, so sensitive and so unforgiving that you have to, <laughs> you have to overcorrect uh, a lot of the time. So when you're trying to go left, if you push the stick all the way to the left, the ship will go to the left but then too far to the left. So you gotta like pull it to the left and then immediately pull it back to the right if you want it to go ease left and then kind of steady out. Uh, so it was very complicated to do on the first try and I think I only get uh, ended up having like 25% of my overall like health or whatever left by the end of it. So I'm not a very good pilot. <laughs> That's what I learned. Uh, but other than the Smuggler's Run ride, I did get to do, uh, Rise of the Resistance. It's the brand new ride that is, uh, that opened in Disney World in Galaxy's Edge December 5th, I think, and it opens in Disneyland in California uh, sometime in January. I think it's early on, like, it might be January 5th too or something like that, um, but I got to do it. But the way they have it set up at Disney World is you have to, because it's so popular, because it's so new and just Galaxy's Edge is so popular in general, you have to uh, get a boarding group to be able to stand in line for the ride. And honestly, I think it worked out pretty well. Uh, so you get, you reserve a boarding group through the, the Disney World app. And um, as I was saying uh, earlier on in the video, my dad and I got there, you know, at 7 o'clock, but it took us 20 minutes to actually be able to scan our magic bands and scan our tickets and get into the park. And until you actually scan those tickets and get into the park, you can't reserve a boarding group. So I had my, you know, my finger on the button waiting for it to light up. Me and my dad, we scanned our bands. I hit the reserve, I hit, I hit the reserve button. And after only 20 minutes, I got group 106 and my time slot was in the evening. And just to tell you how that, to put in context of how, you know, insane that is, that was one of the last boarding groups that they had of the day because they said uh, in the app, it says that um, if your group uh, 121 and above, they don't guarantee that you'll be able to ride the ride, but anything below 120 will be. So I was at least guaranteed to ride the ride, but I had to wait literally all day to do it. And evening ended up being, I think it was 7 o'clock. Uh, yeah, yeah, 7 o'clock to 7.30, somewhere in there, um, where my boarding group actually was finally called. And after they call a boarding group, you have like a two-hour time window to actually go and check in and then start standing in line for the ride. So, you know, but before we did the Rise of the Resistance, uh, we went back to ride Star Tours again for like the fourth time that day because I really like Star Tours and of course they updated it for all the new sequel trilogy stuff except the new Kef Beer sequence which they didn't open up until last Friday or December 20th for the Rise of Skywalker. So I didn't get to see that one but I did get to see all of the sequel trilogy uh, updates and sequences and I think they only have two planets Jakku and Crate for that. I could be wrong. Those are the only two that I saw and I wrote it twice and I got those same two planets twice. So I think those are the only ones. There could be more and if you know let me down, let me know down in the comments. Um, but, so we went and rode Star Tours again, then, uh, came back to Batu, had something to eat, I think I had a, it was a Ronto wrap, and, uh, that was actually really good. Like, the food in Galaxy's Edge, mm, mm, really good, really enjoyed it. Uh, so we went and ate, and then we started standing in line for Rise of the Resistance, and that, uh, the, the actual line, uh, for the ride took about an hour, and I think they tried to keep it keep the line at about an hour uh, all day long um, to keep it, you know, at least somewhat manageable. But I can safely say that the wait definitely was worth it. And Rise of the Resistance is my new favorite ride. Mm, excuse me. My new favorite ride at Disney World. It is so good. It is an 18 minute ride, which is one of, if not the longest ride they have in any of the parks. I could be wrong about that. I don't know right offhand. 
but you, you know, you start, you know, you're walking through the whole, the resistance base on Batu, and then when you finally get to the end, the end of the line, they split you up into, uh, smaller groups, and, uh, there you get a mission from, uh, BB-8, Ray, and, uh, Poe, and you get to see, uh, the, an animatronic BB-8 rolling around, kind of, above you, messing with some computer stuff, and then you get to see a really realistic looking hologram of Ray that is actually Daisy Ridley and then you get to see a little video clip of uh, Poe Dameron which is actually Oscar Isaac and one of my favorite things about uh, Batu and specifically the rides is how they got the actual sequel trilogy actors to record all these little things for these rides because it just adds to that immersion level so much more as opposed to like with Star Tours you know they didn't have any of the original actors or anything uh, that could come back to you know to record lines and stuff aside from like maybe Anthony Daniels but for C-3PO uh, but for uh, Rise of the Resistance it was the actual actors playing their characters and it, it was just really cool to see so you go through this whole sequence where you board a resistance transport and you take off into space you get attacked by the first order and you get captured by the first order and the transport the floor is like a little simulator thing so it's it, it has some light movements like sideways and and up and down and stuff and then uh you get to see out of the windows which are screens um you getting pulled into a first order star destroyer by a tractor beam and then when the ship touches down the same door you came in on opens up and in steps a first order officer he orders everybody off the transport and you go from the transport into this massive i'm i'm pretty sure two scale replica of a star destroyer hangar like this thing is absolutely huge it was amazing then in front of you you have like a row uh you have a, a column of like 50 probably animatronic stormtroopers with a couple more standing around and then also some act like real uh first order officers uh that are you know lining everybody up and then while well, you wait in a second line in the star destroyer and once you go through that line um it, it's kind of set up like you're being processed as a prisoner so they divide you up into smaller groups and put each group in uh, their own prison cell and it goes through this whole sequence with uh, General Hux and Kylo Ren and once that's done somebody uh, cuts a hole in the side of the prison cell the the wall pops out and it's revealed that there's some more resistance soldiers in there and that's when you actually board the cart that is piloted by an astromech whose name is R5 I, I forget the rest of his designation but I do know it's R5 and then R5 takes you through uh, a star destroyer and as uh, as it's being attacked by more resistance ships so you you know you see an animatronic Kylo Ren almost gets sucked out into space when a hole is blown into the side of the destroyer and just the amazing level of detail in this ride is it's just spectacular like I've never seen so much detail into a theme park ride before but I love it I absolutely love it, it is the greatest thing I've ever ever done like you get to see uh not the not the atm6 is not the really big first order walkers but the slightly smaller first order walkers you get to ride like underneath those which i'm again i'm pretty sure are two scale could be wrong about that anyways they are just really big and you know you're going through uh the star destroyer trying to get to the escape pods and when you finally reach the escape pods uh, they're not just ones that, like, shoot out of the ship like we've seen before. These, for whatever reason, are on, like, claws, and they drop down kind of like, uh, I guess, cruise ship lifeboats. So they drop down into, spa into space and then are propelled by a rocket down to uh, the planet. So the, the cart goes in, locks itself down on the floor, and then the floor itself drops down. <laughs> and now it's, it's a straight down drop. And it's not anything like Tower of Terror or anything crazy like that. And I, I think the drop is even less than the the drop on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, which is going down like that instead of just a straight drop. But it's not very far, but it drops you down and then goes through this whole sequence where the escape pod uh, flies down and crashes um, back on Batu, And then uh, you 
the cart backs out of the escape pod and all of a sudden you're in a bunch of ship wreckage and you go through another little sequence and then the ride finally ends. And as I keep saying, it is the most amazing thing I've ever done. If you ever get the chance to go to Galaxy's Edge, which I highly, highly recommend, uh, you have to do Rise of the Resistance. It is so good and every time I go back to Disney World, I'm going to go there and I'm going to do Rise of the Resistance because, you know, even though I know it's going to be the same thing every time, it's still going to take an awful lot of rides to make it feel old or stale or whatever just because it's it's that fun, it's that exhilarating and I just love it. And one of the uh, one of the last things that I did actually before Rise of the Resistance um, was of course I explored all of the the smaller shops where they sell like the pets and the toys and stuff. Uh, but I also got to go into Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities, and that was really where you could tell that the park was very, very crowded inside the shop. It was just wall-to-wall -wall people. Like, you could barely, barely move in there. There was that many people. I actually took a video of it uh, on my phone, just kind of a, a 360 video showing off all of the stuff on the walls, which was also cool. And one of the things I noticed that I don't think has been mentioned before, uh, or at least wasn't there when Galaxy's Edge actually opened in August, is the Mandalorian's helmet. And I'm talking about the same Mandalorian from the Mandalorian Disney Plus show. That same silver Beskar Mando helmet is sitting on Doc Ondar's wall, up there with a bunch of other like Stormtrooper and, and Rebel helmets and stuff. Now, I am very interested to know how Doc Ondar acquired that helmet, because, I mean, so, Doc Ondar's shop is in canon. Your mom's supposed to be there, I was there, like, 25 years after when The Mandalorian is supposed to take place, which is five years after the Battle of Endor. So, somewhere along in that 25 years, he managed to acquire the Mandalorian's helmet and put it on his wall and add it to his collection. I really want to know how he managed to do that, and I, I don't think we're going to get to see it in the actual show, depending on how many seasons there are going to be of the Mandalorian show, and I don't even think we're going to get like a, a detailed uh, story or explanation of how it came into Doc Ondar's possession. I feel like it'll be something that's just kind of mentioned uh, in either some novel or maybe even comic book down the line. We'll just have to wait and see. But that was something I noticed that was very interesting, and I'm, I'm excited to know more about that in particular, because I already know that, you know, Doc Ondar is one of those people who just has a bunch of random stuff from all over the galaxy from a bunch of different time periods. But, like, the thing that I noticed most was that Mandalorian helmet. Like, I, I just really want to know more about that. Uh, but other than uh, Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities, there, and just, you know, general walking around and seeing the ambiance and seeing stormtroopers harassing people and Kylo Ren harassing people, um, I didn't really do anything else uh, in Batu, and I didn't get to see any of the uh, any of the shows they have in Batu where, like, Kylo Ren's over with his ship or... Uh, like Ray Chewbacca and Vi, I think is her name, uh, do a little thing over, um, I think it's by the, uh, oh yeah, it's across from Savi's workshop. Th there's two, like, little mini-show things that I've seen them do there, but they didn't actually do them while I was there, so I didn't get to see that part, um, but overall, I was very happy with my experience, I was very satisfied with, uh, what I got to do, in Galaxy's Edge, despite there being so many people, and just all in all, you should definitely go check it out if you're a Star Wars fan and you're going to Disney World, it should be very high on your priority list, and as I said earlier, if you were interested in custom lightsabers at all, and you want to, you know, experience building one for yourself, getting to choose your own Kyber Crystal color and everything like that, the $200 saber from Galaxy's Edge is, in my opinion, very, very worth it. And I've been recording now for over 30 minutes, so I think I am finally done talking about Galaxy's Edge. 
Uh, as always, I would love to know what you think of Galaxy's Edge if you've been there yourself down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a like as those really do help a small channel like this and consider subscribing if you want to see more Outer Rim Cantina content in your subscription feeds every week. That's all the time I've got for today. I will see you back here in the cantina on Saturday for another Star Wars video. Until then, may the Force be with you.